I managed to get back on the bike and ride about five miles to where I'm now in coverage and I can call the pup and say, hi, I've broken my hand, can you come to me? <laughs> Ain't technology great. Okay. Thank you for coming. This is liner server, hardening, tips and techniques, tricks, hints and kinks, all kinds of stuff. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Gary Smith. I work at down here, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is located over on the other side of the state, over on the dry side, where we get five inches a year if we're lucky. If we're lucky, yes. Um, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory is a DOE lab and Department of Energy. Your tax dollars at work. Um, and um, little URL over there, Hensel. I work in the Environmental Molecular Sciences class, where we do things related to the environment. For instance, uh, one of the, a lot of biological research having to do with uh, all kinds of molecular stuff that, although I have an undergraduate degree in chemistry, I don't understand. Um, we do a lot of stuff with atmospheric research, weather, whatnot. Uh, we do a lot of things with aerosol chemistry, they do a lot of things with surface chemistry, in particular things having to do with ways of storing hydrogen so that we can use that as a fuel in our cars. And to do all of this great processing, we have a supercomputer. Um, it's, when we got it, it was number 20 on the top 10 supercomputers in the world. It is now slid towards about number 50. But it's got 16,000 processors in it. Uh, we're talking storage in the realm of petabytes. Uh, we're talking about very large things. And my responsibility there is the computer security for that supercomputer and all of the imaging infrastructure. So, and of course, it all runs Linux. Uh, we are completely a Linux shop. Um, so, Hardening servers became a very important thrust for me, and uh, this is by no means comprehensive. This is some of my favorite ones. You probably have some of your favorite ones. Uh, maybe you'll pick up a few on the side. Um, so, if this were a perfect world, and as Kirk Vonnegut said in one of his books, it ain't a perfect world, um, I'm giving another <laughs> talk tomorrow about the five golden principles of security, and if this had been a perfect world, that one would have been first, and this one would have been second, so you already know all of this, but uh, I'll find my presentation tomorrow, and you'll find all about this, but those are the five golden principles of security. Know your system, principle of least privilege, defense in depth, protection is key, but detection is a must, and know your enemy. This is about 5% of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, but that's the basic five. Um, had this been a perfect world, you would be able to see how these relate into the various server hardening techniques. But um, that's basically how all of these techniques are organized. Okay, easy one. Since we had our fellow with the uh, EFF here a little bit earlier, encrypt your communications. Uh, use protocols that have some kind of encryption in them. SSH. A replacement for Telnet. SFTP is a replacement for Goal FTP. SCP for secure copy. RSync. Use GPG or something to encrypt and sign your stuff, your, your communication. Um, we use GPG at, uh, at PNL. We also have paid a small fortune to use uh, RSA encryption. We all have, everybody has a little RSA token. Uh, for encrypting their communication. Uh, another thing you can do for your websites, make sure your communication is secure over your websites. Use the Apache module mod SSL to encrypt your web traffic. Lots of protocols are not, have no encryption built into them. So use S-Tunnel 
for those protocols that you may not be able to have no encryption, in, particularly UDP based protocols like for uh, uh, NFS. NFS is all UDP. Uh, if you are really concerned about your NFS transactions being secure, you can wrap them under uh, secure tone. Avoid like a plague. As, as my English teacher back in high school said, avoid cliches like the plague. Okay. <laughs> avoid clear text protocols. Telnet. You use Telnet at, at TNL and you get a nasty gram straight away. We, we monitor that very heavily. RSH, RCP, RXEC, FTP. We don't use those. Those are, those are specific things. Uh, it, it's interesting just from a historical standpoint. Uh, the same guy that developed RSA, RCP, and RXEC also invented send mail. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Allman is responsible for <clears throat> all of those. And as we will see later on, send mail is the poster child for security <laughs> and insecurity. Okay. <coughs> you take the standard default red hat and you plop it on your server. Do you really need all the software that you get there? Probably not. I certainly don't. Um, so, if you don't really need all of that, why put it on there? Um, there are lots of ways to find out what's really installed there. Uh, whenever I have gone in and had to look at a machine forensically, one of the first things I do, if it's a Red Hat machine, RPM-QA pipe mold. See what's installed. Usually everything, usually there's every database product in the world is installed on. You really get it, probably not. Uh, Apache's installed, who knows what else. Um, get rid of those un unneeded patches because what that does is that cuts down on your attack surface. The less there is there, the less the hacker can attack. You can find out all kinds of ways of uh, finding out what's on your system. If you have an Ubuntu system, yum list install, yum root list. Uh, if you want to get rid of something, yum erase package name. If you're on an RPM based system, RPM dash QA type into sort. That gives you a nice sort of listing of everything that's on the system. Um, if you're on the Debian system, you can do deep um, if you want to get rid of a whole group of things, you can do at get remove package. <coughs> and I want to get rid of that whole package. Um, there's a, a similar command on Red Hat systems. Um, yum root dash root root name. Poop, way to go. The whole idea is that you want to have less there so there will be less attack. Yes, sir. So um, that's an interesting approach. My approach, though, is to be very aware of what's running, because if it's, if it's not running, then it's not really an attack surface, at least from outside. And two, be very, very aware of what's SUID, because if it's, if it's, if it's something installed, it's not running, it's not SUID, is it really an attack surface? Um, if it's installed, somebody could potentially break into the machine and start it. Besides, having a secure base is a whole idea. Uh, just because it's turned, you can turn a lot of things off. And quite honestly, unfortunately, good old Red Hat makes for lots of dependencies. So you you get into this R what I call RPM head. <laughs> you, you want to get rid of something, and you go RPM dash dash erase packaging, boom, and it says, can't do this because all of these other packages are dependent on it. And you start looking at it and you go, well, you know, I don't really need that package, I don't really need that package, I don't really need all of those. So now what you do is you now say RPM dash dash erase, whole bunch of packages, and you go, boom, and it comes back and says, no, all of these packages that you're trying to delete are dependent, are dependent on all of these other things. And you just can't, and it's one of those things that you can't get rid of. Um, but um, on the systems that we have, they're you know, in our infrastructure and on the systems here, we have a very reduced space of, uh, oh, let's see, and this is actually more than I would particularly prefer, but our base infrastructure servers have approximately 
depending on their function, somewhere between 320 and 340 packages installed, as opposed to the standard thing, which is somewhere on the order of 2,000 packages. Yes. Just real quick, in response to that, the reason, one of the best reasons not to just leave packages on there is because you can make a, a mistake in your check plate. You can turn on something that you don't know you turned on. Oh, absolutely. And you, if you're not monitoring for it, the next time that machine gets rebooted, you don't know you have that security. Oh, yeah, it's, it's very easy to, to turn on something that you don't. Yes. So, how do you keep users from installing their own packages, even if it's just in their own These are servers, and they don't have users. The only users are system administrator. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. This is one of the this is one of the major causes of somebody within the past couple of weeks um, put out a uh, is either a white paper or a news article saying that ninety percent of the problem with Windows is the fact that people can't install stuff on their system. And we we don't have that problem. We're um, the users cannot install software on the, on the infrastructure system. Yes, sir. In response to him, you could just mount, you just mount the uh, home partition as no exact. Yeah, you can mount That doesn't work everywhere. That doesn't work. still fighting to take away sudo privileges. Oh, yes. Yeah, probably, probably you probably should not give them the first place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, giving, at least giving them sudo, as we will see, that, that, that's at least a step in the right direction because. Um, you can limit what they can do, and you can, of course, put in some monitoring on that. Okay. Um, <coughs> make sure your kernel is up to date. Um, I have things running on all the systems that do checks, and anytime a uh, the um, there has been an RPM uh, a Red Hat update to the kernel, if the system uh, has is up for say two weeks and it hasn't been rebooted. Uh, and getting the kernel in there, I know about it. Um, the, um, you need to get those kernels in your software updated. Uh, Red Hat, uh, CentOS, Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, all of those have many techniques by which you can just <coughs> apply the updates automatically. Um, we, since we have such a small surface of uh, uh, packages on our infrastructure machines, with only one or two minor exceptions, we just go ahead and accept the updates from Red Hat. Uh, because we know that that's not going to cause any problems. There's one particular server where we don't do that because it's our take robot library, and it's got some very special drivers in it to manipulate the arms of the robots that move the tapes in and out and all that. So uh, we don't do updates on it quite as often as through our other production servers. Um, but keeping the kernel up to date, keeping your software update is very important. That's one of the problems with Windows. Um, people don't keep their software up to date. Um, okay, I'm from Texas. And you start talking about oil, water, or cattle in Texas, and the phrase usually pops up Them's fighting words, partner. Well, this is probably fighting words to some people. Um, turning on SE Land <coughs> or App Armor, that gets a lot of people upset. And in fact, I had to deal with that just this past week where somebody turned off SE Linux on an important server. And you don't do that without telling me about it firsthand. Tell me if you're going to turn it off. Come to me first. Don't just turn it off. Could you go back to the last page for a second? Sure. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what is a cron job? Cron job. Cron runs things periodically. Mm -hmm. So okay. let's say that um, you want to uh, run an accounting job uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning. Cron lets you do this. Unless you do that, or only, or do, or say do something uh, once a month, or every hour, or actually we have something that runs in some cases. Yeah, um, 
a lot of people get really inflamed when they start talking about, well, do we really want to run SE Linux? Um, Fedora has had SE Linux turned on as part of its basic install ever since version 10, and most people don't notice. Um, the, the policies that come with Red Hat now and Fedora are good enough that most people don't notice that it's turned on. And it really makes things a lot better. Um, over on the Debian Ubuntu side, App Armor, similar function, different idea, different basis. Uh, GR Security, I'm not sure if a lot of people are using that anymore, but it's the same basic idea. You want to limit the uh, privilege and control people have and the processes have. For instance, um, one of the things about the SE Linux and App Armor limit is what the Apache web server can do. Do you really want the Apache web server looking at your Etsy password, your Etsy shadow? Probably not. If they tried through some hacker manipulating the code or through some sort of exploit on an SE Linux system, Apache won't. Will not access their, is prevented from accessing Etsy password, Etsy shadow and returning that to the hacker. It just doesn't work. It limits what the process or the user can do. So think about it. And, and the thing about both Etsy Linux and App Armor is they have a mode of operation where it tells you what's wrong, but it doesn't prevent things from going through. Um, uh, Etsy Linux in particular has a <coughs> what they call permissive mode, where it tells you what's wrong but it still lets things go through. App Armor has something similar. It's in learning mode. The only thing is, is that if things are insecure and it learns that they're insecure, then you perpetuate the bad model. But, uh, okay. Um, <coughs> password. Um, use the user mod and user del functions, uh, commands, to maintain your accounts. Now, don't use the I Etsy password. That's just not a good way to do it. But back in the old days, 20 years ago, that's what we all used to make modifications to Etsy passwords. We just did the I Etsy password, and away we went. Um, and then somebody decided, you know, that's really not so good. And then we had the IPW and the IGR. But user mod and user del had user add. Those are the ways to do them now from all from the command. <coughs> I, I have a question about that. Why, um, why would you use uh, user add, user mod, and user del rather than the INC password? Oh, a very good question. When you use these commands, you take out a lock against Etsy password, Etsy shadow. Etsy group and group password file if you have that. That prevents somebody else from making a change on top of what you may have put in. If you go the VI Etsy password route, two people editing the file at the same time. Whoever saves last wins. Exactly. <laughs> last save wins. Any changes you put in, go away. If, you're, if you finish before the second guy. This is why you want to use user mod, user del, all of that. If you're the first one in, the next person says that tries to make a change, they get a little message that says password lock, shadow lock, group lock. They're prevented from making a change while you do make your change. Even so, if you're using VI and you're editing Etsy password to somebody else um, decides to edit Etsy password, they get uh, a message that someone else is editing. No. no. Vi doesn't do that. No. Vi no. Unless specific. you have two people on the same user. If you have two different users editing the file, then they don't do that. Even though the same, if they're the same file, user, they get the message. Editor. If they're different users, nope. Sorry. Yes, sir. Somewhere in past history, there was a VIPW. Yes, VIPW. Is that still around? That is still around, mm -hmm. absolutely. There you go. 
The DMPW works, and it works by the same mechanism. It takes out a lock against the file that prevents somebody else from using it. The IGR does the same thing. I was going to say that one of the benefits of user add is you can do it in a script. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, as we, and, and scripts are one of the greatest things that makes a, a system administrator's life so much easier. You've got, uh, a bunch, got a bunch of users to add because you've got a whole raft of summer students coming in. Bingo. Point user add, add it. All nice and neatly done. Uh, unfortunately, in these tough economic times, you may have a bunch of users that you want to get rid of because they're being laid off. Uh, user deal. I've, I've been down that route before. Doesn't user add and user mod also uh, want those encrypt passwords as well? Yes, it will. And whereas like BI doesn't does have any encryption. It so. has no encryption. Well, I wouldn't be putting the passwords with BI. You'd be taking them out, probably. But you'd be taking them out. Speaking of passwords, a good password policy. Oh, yeah. Eight characters containing some mixture of alphabetics, numerals, special characters, upper and lower case. special Good password policy. And speaking of, give me uh, Speaking of passwords, <clears throat> during a recent company password audit, it was found that a blonde secretary in California was using the following password: Mickey, Minnie, Pluto, Huey, Dewey, Louie, Donald, Goofy, Sacramento. <laughs> When asked why she had such a long password, she was told that she was, she said she was using the password policy. It has to be at least eight characters long and include one capital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd, like to see, I'd like to see how John the Ripper would do with that password. <laughs> yes, sir. So I thought maybe reducing the odds to one in four billion would be okay. Yeah. I just grabbed hexadecimal entry of out of dev random. Uh, yeah. And um, and I find out that after using a password maybe ten times, I've memorized it. Yeah. Um, I I don't have a problem with my with my mental capacity for remembering the password. What I have found is I have muscular memory uh. for <laughs> typing the password, and that is much harder for me to get over is that muscular memory of how my fingers work to type in a password. Um, yeah, uh, there, there are many ways for coming up with good passwords. Uh, my favorite one is not so much a password, but some sort of phrase that I can remember and using letters out of that phrase. Uh, one, one fellow I knew years ago uh, he was a big Doors fan. He thought he thought Jim Morrison was the was the greatest thing that ever lived. He wanted to go over to Paris and, and go to the the grave uh, and see Jim Morrison's grave there and leave some little something for it. He thought the Lizard King was great. But what he did was he would take the first letter from Doors songs and use that as um, or or a phrase from a Doors song. And use that as, as, as his password. Um, one of the things that you can use to enforce good password policy is this PAM module, like PAM crack live. Um, as they're trying to put in their new password to the password command, if you have, if you're using PAM crack live, it will look to see if you can, if it's a good password according to policy that you can set up. Pick a password, you can remember it. Uh, the gentleman over here likes hexadecimal numbers. Yeah, I can remember the new password. It's making my fingers remember that's the hard problem. Um, there are tools that you can use to test whether or not your users are using good passwords. Uh, I like John the Ripper. Um, uh, John the Ripper works very well. I use, I've done, also use that in forensic investigation. Yes, sir. So, this has actually come up at my workplace, and I, I refuse to be a part of um, scanning for the passwords because I I know that some of these passwords that we're going to find are going to be the same passwords that people use for their bank institution or for other mm -hmm. sorts of things. And I don't want to know the passwords. I only want to know if the passwords are broken. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have any advice for that? Um, Our users run the gamut. We've got yeah. know, high technical people and then, you know, Low technical people who are going to use Mickey Mini, yeah. Yeah, Mickey Mini, Mickey Mini, Goofy Type, yeah. Um, 
Is there a software that tells you whether the, the password is strong or not? If it doesn't take um, Yeah, there are there are programs out there that will judge the strength of a password. Uh, usually, there are some sort of a web app. But even then, you have to break the password before you. Can I think I think no. you can use Hydra. Hydra might work. Yeah, that would be a good choice. There there are there are several. Um, Several things that will test the password before as they type it in, and and do that. Um, and I don't remember any of them right offhand. Yes, sir. But this morning we saw this great presentation on just how easy it is to data mine all the private data mm -hmm. from all of our lives. I mean, it's occurred to me that if someone really wanted to build accurate password lists, they'd use some probability algorithms. They mine our data, and uh, <coughs> this makes uh, the dev random thing a stronger for a stronger argument. Oh yeah, and if you know where hacker sites are, you can go out and download any number of sizes of rainbow tables of, of passwords. I've done that. Mm -hmm. Off track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's lots of, hostelavista.com um, has lists of rainbow tables. Uh, that's one of my favorite places to go find them. Uh, they're particularly good for uh, where I've had to do some forensic analysis to uh, on, on the password. Yes, sir. Uh, one thing that people should be mindful of, if you're working in a corporation where you're doing checking password strength, you use any type of tools that will be looking for password strengths, whatnot, make sure you get management approval prior to doing that because you open yourself up to a real lot of... Oh, yes. Uh, the, the Randall Schwartz fiasco, which, which occurred even when I was in Oregon, yes. The Randall Schwartz fiasco where he was doing what he thought was his job, but uh, the management didn't see it that way. And, and when I have used John the River, it has been someone has come to me and said, I need you to do a forensic investigation on this. I just don't, I don't go out there and just snark people's passwords. No, that, that's, that's not ethical thing, ethical behavior for a system administrator to do. Someone has to come to me and say, I need you to do this. Okay, put it in my, it will, it will, it will. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, one of the things since we had this marvelous supercomputer there that's got 16,064 uh, bit uh, A and D cores on it, there's another thing called distributed John the Ripper that will crack a password across a computer, do, do it across a computer network. And <laughs> here we have. 16,064 bit nodes with 64 gigabytes in each machine to do that could be used for password tracking. Do I worry about somebody tracking passwords using distributed John the Ripper? Yes, I do. Do I check for it? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, passwords are down. Password. Age the passwords. Don't let somebody use the same password over and over. <coughs> John the Ripper, I'm not familiar with it. Isn't it just doing a brute force password attack? No. Uh, it does brute force. It does, uh, it uses rainbow tables. It uses other various techniques. Dictionary attacks. Uh, dictionary attacks. It, it has a whole gamut of techniques. Uh, just, uh, just go out to Source Forge and type John the Ripper in, and they'll tell you where to go. But a lot of the Linux systems by default will employ techniques like after X number of incorrect password attempts start uh, introducing delays and stuff. And that would make the tools like that much less effective if you started using no. the files. No. You don't use that to get the password. No, you don't use that to get the password. You just put the password hash into it. Just use password. What about the salt? Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, Don Griffin works on that too. Um, uh, oh yes. John edit password with the bi password. John edit shadow with the bi. Um, you can restrict the the reuse of the passwords. Um, and as the gentleman over here was saying, uh, if um, someone it's a certain number of uh, passwords incorrect, lock the password out. But unlock, we, we unlock it after a certain number of attempts after the period of time. Um, 
this may be some, this is a policy decision at your particular site, whether or not you want to re-enable it or work. Somebody has to call up and say, hi, I blocked my password out, can you please unlock it? But that's a policy decision. The good rule is 24 hours or, you yeah, because um, hackers are going to try to get your password on the weekend when you're not at your office. Right, so. right. Now, now, in one situation, on one of our, some of our nodes uh, that are external to the internet, if you, and this is mostly to keep uh, SSH brute force attacks down, is that if um, um, an IP address, if somebody coming in gets um, uh, 10 bad passwords uh, attempts in a very short period of time, uh, the more, many more than you can get by just typing them in, we block that IP address for one hour. And then after another hour, we turn it back on. But that's, that's our policy decision. Um, empty passwords in NC Shadow. That little off command there will tell you whether or not you have any empty passwords in NC Shadow. Yes, sir? No, I was going to say, shouldn't it be using key authentication anyway? Should it be using what? Uh, PubKey authentication. You know, we do not allow PubKey uh, uh, We do not allow PubKey across the internet. That's our policy. You have to type. You you, you have to type. And in fact, we we're really paranoid about it. Uh, first of all, you have to enter your RSA token ID, which requires something you have, something you know, and you have to get that right. And then you have to type in the account password to get it. So. Uh, no, we do not. Our, our policy says no public key authentication. Um, one of the things that some system administrators do is they like to hide backdoor root accounts. If you've got any backdoor root accounts, that will let you know. Um, a discipline thing. Never log into root directly. We, we, we do not log that. Our policy says you do not log. The only place that you log into root directly is from the console, and we prevent it everywhere but the console. Um, if you log into a system to do system administration, you log in with your personal user account, and then do your commands to suit it. Uh, so you increase your uh, security because you can allow fine grained control. Uh, another thing is that it provides an audit trail, which is very good to know um, what is going on. Uh, we'll talk about that audit, about a little interesting audit trick a little bit later on. Yes, sir? So, um, we've had problems limiting sudo access because a lot of interesting commands allow you to execute other commands, like sudo and any editor. Oh, yes. To be root. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, is there a way to limit that down? Uh, don't allow them to use those commands that allow you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds like a, a cop out, but you know, that's, that's the only way. All right, then, is there any way to know which commands will allow someone to do that? And even sudo less is too much. Um, well, it seems like the cop Yeah. I could have some use of your user account. It allows editing, right? You have to sudo, and now we can edit the system file. Right, and that, that's... So you have to have a whitelist. Well, you have to have a whitelist, and part of that is just keeping... is knowing your system and knowing how <laughs> these things can operate, and knowing how you can um, limit your users. Um, we have to really need a whitelist, because the other advantages of sudo like the RV, are gone if you can do something like sudo hash. <laughs> well, obviously, but you don't want to let your users do that. Sure. You, want to, you want to limit the scope of what they can do. Um, um, physical security. Um, some of our servers are in a locked room behind a locked room. Uh, you have to have two levels of access to get in there. But uh, you may not have the luxury of having something like that. Um, but what you can do is you can configure your BIOS so that they, somebody can't just reboot the system, plug in a USB device, stick in CD or DVD, and, and reboot with Nautics, for instance. Um, you can uh, put the grub password on the bootloader. One of the things that you can do is, of course, you can disable the free finger salutes to prevent somebody from doing control all the um, 
require the root user. If it comes up in single user, somebody tries to come up in single user mode, make them give the root password. Um, put all of your production servers in a data center. That may not necessarily be applicable for some people because I was in a situation at a former place where I had to have my servers out in public areas, so I did all of this to protect the servers. Um, most importantly, make sure that your people who are doing the administration are trustworthy, have some kind of security check. Um, your network attack service. How do you know what's running? Uh, you can do it either one of two ways. That's that TULIP, T-U-L-P. Well, we'll give you a short list, a nice concise list, of all the ports that are open and the programs they're using. Or if you want to use NMAP, which is a, one of my favorite tools, NMAP, the particular set of options in the host name, will tell you what services are running on another system. <coughs> Turning them off, you can do service, service name, stop, and then check and pick it off. Turn the service off if you don't need it. And believe me, there are lots of services out there that you may be running that you probably don't know that you're running. Like, for instance, the Abahi daemon. If you're not running, if you're not on an Apple network, you don't need that. Turn it off. Yes, sir. Now, wouldn't that be a good, a good reason to use uh, that filter to block a lot of ports? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's a little bit a couple of ones you want. Only opens the one you want, block everything else. Exactly. Um, X Windows, do you need X Windows on your server? Probably not. I certainly don't. Um, we don't install X at all on any of our infrastructure servers. Um, usually, X Windows runs at run level 5. If you set your run level 3, uh, you can prevent it from coming up. Um, get rid of it. Down the group remove the X Windows system. Way over. Um, we like to use this partitioning as a way of segregating things. If you look at most standard installs, you get two partitions. You get slash and you get swap. If you segregate things off, you can do more interesting things. For instance, you can put, you can have separate boot partition, separate uh, partition for user, home, bar, and temp, and, and apply root. different protections to them to get some interesting things. Um, once you've got things partitioned off, you can do some fancy things with that's yet. FS tab, the file system tab that tells you how to uh, <coughs> mount the various file systems. Those three options, no exec, cannot honor the exec bit on any binaries that you've found. No doubt, don't honor uh, device files on the foreign file system. No SUID, if the file is set to be SUID or GUID, and you have it mounted, no SUID, the kernel will not mount those bits. And not run the ID. Yes, sir. If you're doing uh, split partitions like you were talking about, would it be uh, occasionally useful to uh, mount a lot of <coughs> or like user read only and then just call oh, it in, in fact, um, in fact, uh, um, on the, uh, that, that's one of the reasons for partitioning after them out that way, is that you can leave, you can leave some of them, um, being writable, like for, like maybe your boot partition, so that Red Hat can come to Red Hat and come through and update your kernel. But user, you would mount as read only, so that somebody uh, can't just monkey with your uh, settings out there. Um, someone was talking about set UID and GUID. <coughs> uh, know your system. Know where your set UID files are. For instance, uh, if you want to find your set UID files. That find command will do it. Find is one of the most <coughs> useful commands on a Unix system, Linux system that I know of, but it took me a long time to figure it out. Um, that first command will find all your set UID files. The second one will find all your set GID files. Um, you can put it into one big command and do it this way and provide yourself a list. Um, it's very useful to when you sometimes when you get a system installed, run those commands, find out what they are, put those away in file. Or you can do like I do and run a program called RK Hunter, which stands for Rootkit Hunter. Rootkit Hunter, when you initialize it, does this for you. The next time you run it, it will tell you if there have been any changes. 
um, world writable file. <coughs> oh, gee. Uh, anybody can modify a world writable file for their own purposes. That find command will find um, world writable files by either either by group or by the world itself. Um, if you want to find world writable directories, you can find them that way. A lot of software I found installs um, with UIDs that aren't owned by anybody in my has for it's a shadow file. Real easy way to find files that nobody owns because that provides for real interesting situations when you put that UID in. Uh, that command there at the bottom will find all the files that nobody owns. And it's really easy to remember because no easy to go through. No, no tricky things with permissions or anything like that. Actual real commands. A centralized log server. Um, there's a chap here that's going to be talking about syslog and G. Um, either today or tomorrow, I forget the But we have a centralized log server. And all of our logs funnel into that one point. We keep them on the individual systems, but they still all funnel to that one point so that we can do uh, correlation analysis. Um, uh, we can do many, many different things with having all the logs in, in one place. Um, for instance, uh, core scans. Uh, that kind of information gets logged by each individual machine, but that all comes into the centralized syslog server. So we can look to see if someone is scanning a whole range of machines or if they're just doing one. Um, user troubles, it can save on disk space. Um, uh, there's also the ability, once they're all in the centralized place, that you can keep them as an archive so that we can go back and look at things for, say, perhaps six months to a year ago. System log analysis. Yes, sir. A couple of security classes I've taken recently recommend not having a syslog server because <coughs> they are making it too easy for the hacker because once he gets to that box with that syslog for every server on your network, he doesn't have to worry about getting from box to box. He can that's right. hide his trail in that one box for all the servers. That's, that's very true, and that, that's a possibility. Uh, again, that is a that is that is something you need to look at as part of a risk analysis. Uh, we deem that it was better to have uh, a centralized log server. Uh, we were willing to accept some risk on it. I can personally tell you, our centralized syslog server is our most secure. And it, and it is running SEMs at a very high level. And there aren't many or very many people that can log into it. There are, it's stripped down even more than most of our regular infrastructure. It's, that's where the keys to, that's where a lot of the keys to the kingdom are. So it's, it's a very tight machine. You need to tree up. If somebody penetrates the system without a centralized log server, the first thing you can do is truncate, truncate the log. There goes the log trail. But at least if you use a centralized auto, uh, auto log server, you have a chance of seeing an auto trail if that's a public system trail and you can look at the various issues. And this is all part of this is all part of how much risk are you willing to accept? How much say, what is your risk analysis? what is your risk analysis today? How much risk are you willing to accept? How and once you have determined what the risks are how can you mitigate them down to an acceptable level? And it may very well be that one of the things you might want to do is you, you don't want to do anything. You want to transfer that risk over to somebody else and let them accept it. Uh, that, that's a very, that's a very, that, that is a technique of risk mitigation is getting somebody else to accept the risk. For instance, we don't do our own, our own maintenance, heaven forbid, but we have a service contract with the provider of our supercomputer to take care of all that maintenance and there's there when you've got over twenty thousand discs, if you're still getting the industry average for disc failures, you've got two guys running around all day swapping discs in and out. Uh, but we've accepted the risk for having all of those discs and we've mitigated it by transferring the risk to the service provider. So this whole thing with my friends that you're talking about, that's all part of the risk analysis and how much risk you're willing to accept and how you can mitigate the risk to an acceptable level. 
Does that uh, server send them an email and tell them that a drive is down? Uh, actually, we have a we, we have a system somewhat similar to that, but it's not email. It's, um, we, we can find out when these things happen. Uh, like we have an IBM mainframe that actually phones IBM and tells it that it's got a problem and what the problem is and tells it to fix it. Gee, that sounds like OnStar. <laughs> but IBM is very good at that. Um, two of my favorite uh, uh, programs for looking at logs, log wash, log check. These are automated programs that uh, will give you brief summaries of your logs rather than actually having with the number of nodes that we have. It is absolutely ridiculous to try to look at the logs for uh, over 2,500 machines. Um, log wash, log check makes it much easier. Log watch is up to something like version seven and a half. It's been out there for a long time. Uh, you can just install it, turn it on, and the, the default report is more than enough for anything that you might want. Um, log check, another software package uh, to look at your log files, look for security violations. Yes, sir. Are those configurable as far as what you want to look for? Oh, absolutely. They're, they're both tremendously configurable. Um, the uh, uh, log watch <coughs> is, um, is, is perhaps 99% uh, comments about what each parameter does so that you can you can modify it. Most of the files mostly is, is all comments and it is tremendously configurable. Um, but the, the default one that you just install is is good enough for uh, probably ninety percent of most installations. How are we doing for time? Oh, ten minutes oh okay. Another fighting words kind of thing. Audit D. A lot of people think that audit D is a part of SC Linux. It is not. Audit D runs uh, standalone without uh, without SC Linux being there, but it can give you a very good audit trail of things. It's one of my favorite programs. Uh, it reads this file called Audit Rules that tells you what kind of things you want to audit, uh, and it can give you some very interesting answers to some very interesting questions. And if you want to get a lot of bang for your Audit D buck, I recommend these two commands. You can you can go out and get all kinds of rules files for Audit D. You can get NISPOM Chapter 8, you can get the LSPP, you can get CSPP. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. They're very long and very complicated. But these two, these two are my favorite ones because these will tell you anytime somebody accesses a file they shouldn't be. And what it does is it says if, <coughs> I like to do this from the command line. The reason why I like to do it from the command line I can embed this architecture command in there so that I get the right architecture, whether it's 32-bit, 64-bit power PCs, whatnot. This says if somebody, if a fail happens on a create an open, an open attach truncate, F truncate, you get either uh, an error in access or an error permission, it will log it to the audit D, will log it to the audit D file. Now what's this little funny bit here? A little funny bit here. Okay. If the AUID is greater than 500, which is normal users, usually normal users start at 500. Siemens are 0 to 499. This is really minus 1. But that's minus 1 on sign. Okay. A lot of processes that get started by cron end up having minus 1 for an AUID, and this will filter them out. So this way, you get the important stuff without getting all, without getting a lot of trash in there. Okay. Here's a fun one. This one I really like. This is one of my favorites. Audit D and PAM library working together. Okay. There's this marvelous PAM module called PAM TTY Audit. You set it up with this line in say your SU and sudo uh, PAM configuration file. The next time somebody executes sudo or SU, set as root, say. This, this is, I'm interested in tracking root commands. There's many ways you can do this with regular audit, but this is much, much more elegant, much cheaper. The next time somebody issues the root, all of their user commands 
will get logged into the audit file. They type PI, they type remove, all that gets put into the audit file. And then to get that trail back, this command. That will get it back from the audit file. Yes, sir. What happens if you're, say, using the minus site or minus s option to sudo that give you a shell workload? Or is there something that would log the entire output and input that goes in? Or? Actually, if you, that's the reason for doing this. If somebody, you put, somebody does sudo su minus bing, okay, now they're root. Assuming that they can be root. Every command they type until they log out. And including any processes that they create below that. All that goes into the audit file. Yes, sir. Um, for those of us who aren't writing all this down that rapidly, do you have a, a spot where this PowerPoint yes, or whatever is going to show up later? Yes, I know. This is, <laughs> there, there's lots of good commands here. Lots of good commands here. And um, but by the way, um, see that 0A there? What does that do? Why is that there? 0A, that's a carriage turn. And this command, xxd, turns that hex string into characters, and that 0A there makes it have a carriage turn, otherwise they all get bunched up. It took me a while to figure that one out. Uh, okay. Uh, intrusion detection systems, two kinds. NIDs and HIDs. NIDS is network intrusion detection. HIDS is host intrusion detection. Um, there's many ways to do intrusion detection. If you want to do it easy, PSET. Great book on PSET by the guy who wrote it. Um, uh, it even has the capability of processing snort signatures. If you want to do it the hard way, do snort. Now requires a lot of other infrastructure with it. Go the PSET route. Um, how do you know if somebody has changed, if a file has changed on your system? Well, there's lots of ways you can do that. But um, one of my favorite ways is to use AID, Advanced Intrusion Detection something. <laughs> anyway. That's like tripwire. It's a, right. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer to think of AID as tripwire light. It's got all of the, all of the <coughs> functionality of tripwire without all of that overhead. Um, and you get nice system intrusion, nice uh, uh, intrusion detection there. IPv6, do you really need IPv6 if you're not running IPv6? Turn it off. Um, here's how you can do it. Um, uh, change it in your mod probe. Uh, I, um, this command here. What this does is this causes bin true to be loaded whenever IPv6 needs to be loaded. Bin true always returns success and it does nothing. So it's sort of like your 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 brother in law. It's very <laughs> successful at doing nothing. Um, you can also turn it off also turn it off by making those changes and reboot. Uh, network parameters, some things you can do to fortify your network. Turn IP forwarding off. If you've got two interfaces, do you really want to act as a router? Um, do you really want to process redirects? No. Uh, that might be not so good. Um, do you want to accept source routes? No. Uh, log Martians, this is one of my favorite ones. Log, log bizarre activity on your network. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or ignore broadcast. Turn SIM cookies on so that you improve your IP stack. Okay. And last but not least, Make your government work for you. <laughs> okay. This is an excellent article, an excellent piece of um, very well written book available from the NSA and it's free. You don't have to have a clearance. This tells you everything you might want to know about how to harden well bond. Uh, it's a very large PDF file, it's about 170 pages, but it's very well written, your government paid for it, download it, a lot of the material that came from this came from there, I used uh, the document to get this stuff. 
Um, if you want to find out some specifics about hardening RHEL 5, RHEL 5, this particular site, Steve Grubb is the main author of Audit D and works on the SMA security team. Um, he has a very, this is a very nice presentation uh, on how to do hardening. A uh, very good book, James Turnbull's book. Um, one minute, wow. <laughs> okay. How do we get this? Uh, how do we get this? I will post this. Also, the National Security Agency has lots of video training that you can, they will send you in a box for free, like they got probably 100 CDs of how to harden servers. Yeah. If you send them an email and explain who you are and why you want it, they'll, they'll send it all to you free of charge, they pay the post and everything. And they got all kinds of things on how to harden web servers, how to harden oh, yeah. Linux boxes, it's all free. It's all government. free. Make the government work for you. This is, this is free stuff. Uh, I, I highly recommend the Rel5 guide if you have Rel5. Uh, the is available off the network. Terminal floor is just excellent. Any questions? Yes, sir. What recommendations do you have for managing the root user passwords? Uh, number one. Very few people need to be need the root password. You have a very small number of people that get them that have the password. Um, we wrote as part of our security policy, we have a new root password every month. Um, when I I distribute a year's worth of root passwords to the selected individuals, when I distribute them. They have to give me their old one back, which I destroy. They have to, I give them the new one, they have to sign for it. Um, we, we, kind of, we use kind of what I call, okay, there, there's one factor authentication and there's two factor authentication. One factor authentication is something you know. Two factor authentication is something you have and something you know. For instance, a secure ID token and a pin number. We use something kind of that I call factor and a half authentication. There is something that we we know, which is a a pre-pin that you have to put with what's on the little piece of paper in order to get the, in order to have the root password. Okay. So that that little pre-pin doesn't change very often. So I call it factor and a half. But, it, but it's still, it's something you have, something you know. Uh, but it's not, it, it's a little bit less complicated. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, only allow root login to the console. Uh, do not allow root login through the network. If somebody's going to log in through the network to do some root user activity, they have to use either their own ID or maybe a, um, since we have network passwords working through uh, Active Directory, sometimes Active Directory is there so they don't use their own passwords, so we have a uh, unprivileged management account that they can log into this local, this bar and that, but um, the, the whole idea is that for any root activity, root logging in, you want to be, you want to limit it, and you want to make it accountable and auditable so that you can say, oh, Fred logged in on Saturday night and he restarted our data and he issued root and restarted the database. Limiting and accountability. Those are, those are the two major things that you want to do on your root password. Yes, sir. What's your uptime on something like that? Do you ever reboot a 16,000? <laughs> um, actually, we reboot it. Probably, we reboot everything probably um, once a month because we have regularly scheduled downtime for some of our maintenance stuff. Otherwise, we're when things are just running and we don't have any glitches like them. Unfortunately, our uh, 
vendor sent us a crappy uh, firmware that sorts the, uh, the BIOS and would allow a bunch of machines to reboot. Um, we see 99% uptime. Uh, Linux is a wonderful server operating system. Uh, at a former place that I used to work for, I had a much smaller cluster. Um, the thing ran for over a year without a reboot. Um, it's, it's that good. But yeah. we do have for so. something that big. We, 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 we have regular scheduled maintenance <clears throat> once a month. So we, we do reboot it. And just as, a, as an interesting point, when we have to put in a whole new distribution, um, like for instance, saying going, going from rail 4 to rail 5, we can do that in an hour and a half. Literally. The system is specially designed to be able to squirt the whole new distribution out in mass, both fast and connect, and it, it takes an hour and a half. This is 2,000 plus nodes that are getting refreshed, and it takes an hour and a half. It's impressive to watch. It's, there aren't enough homeless people in the Tri Cities. If we could stick CDs and DVDs and all of the slots to to rebuild it that way, with something that large, you've got to have that kind of manageability built in. Where are you posting your presentation? Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give it to the Linux to the Linux Fest guy, and he can he can post it there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.